Welcome, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, and thank you all for joining me to learn uh, this afternoon about our rapid on-site test method for detecting patulin and juices. Uh, my name is Jim Donovan. I'm the Director of Food Safety Sales and Marketing at Eurofins of Praxis. Um, please keep my uh, email um, address there or make note of it. Uh, just in case down the road you wish to receive some information or have further questions that come to mind, um, or if there's an application opportunity and you wish to reach out, um, that's the email address you can reach me at and be happy to reply back to you with and answer any questions that you may have. A bit about our agenda. Uh, this presentation will probably last between 30 to 40 minutes. Um, going to, it's broken down into four parts, the patulin contamination and juices, uh, regulations and recalls, uh, the applications, and then uh, the kit overview, <clears throat> which is how to run, actually run the patulin Lysa test kit. Uh, questions on the right-hand side, if you have any, please uh, enter them into the uh, box on your go to webinar panel. <clears throat> I will try my best to answer them at the end of the uh, session. Before we talk, uh, before I speak about the patulin test method, I'd like to uh, give a little bit of background about Eurofins Technologies and Eurofins Abraxas. So there's an understanding of who we are and what we do. So Eurofins Technologies is a fast growing global provider of diagnostic test kits, lab consumables, and industry leading ELISA based instrument platforms, supporting the rapid testing in the food, feed, environmental, biopharma, and clinical markets. Now, Abraxas fits within the industrial solutions division. That's where our product line fits. Uh, Eurofins Technologies, as it relates to the industrial solutions uh, sector, is, is, a, is comprised of a consortium of global rapid test kit developers. And in this category, not only do we offer patulin test kits and, and other kits um, from Abraxas, but also through our, our Eurofins Technologies partners, Test kits are available for food allergens, for pathogens, for GMOs, for many mycotoxins, for veterinary drug residues, and more. Um, so we have a wide range, a wide breadth of products, probably one of the broadest uh, that's out there in the marketplace. And we're going to be focused on ELISA today, and I'll describe that in a minute. But our te test methodologies within the Industrial Solutions Group also include lateral flow devices or strip tests, and PCR. So we have uh, different test, method, test methods that will uh, cover a range of applications or needs. A bit about Abraxas. We joined the Eurofins Technologies in 2017. We have over 20 years of history in developing, manufacturing, and marketing rapid environmental food and life science test systems. And many of our products are validated or verified by agencies such as the US EPA. In fact, uh, we have a US EPA promulgated test method for algal toxins, the only one in the, uh, in the world. Uh, the USDA, the USGS, the FDA, the Japanese Ministry of the Environment and World Health Organization. We also hold an exclusive our, or are an exclusive licensee of key, several key technology patents with additional applications and process. And our goal is to meet the testing needs of research and industry. Uh, we, we offer a lot of products into the research marketplace and obviously uh, a significant amount of products into the, the general food uh, uh, category or industry. And our products would include patulin, which we're here to speak about today, but also glyphosate, algal toxins, pesticides, and more. And I should mention that our glyphosate, rapid glyphosate test uh, products, both a lateral flow strip and an ELISA method, are the only uh, glyphosate, rapid glyphosate test methods in the world. We are the provider of the only glyphosate method in the world. And most of the products, including the Patchland test kit, are available globally through our Eurofins uh, Technologies Network, which basically covers uh, 
as I said, globally, we have we have expertise in all regions of the world. Okay, petulant contamination of juices. Um, before I, I start, I just sort of want to go over a little bit about some of the testing methods out there in the marketplace. Patulin is a mycotoxin. And from mycotoxin analysis, there's a range of analytical solutions. You can categorize them, I guess, in two sectors. There's rapid and there's reference. So on the rapid side, methods such as flowometry, lateral flow, and ELISA, or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, which is which uh, the patulin, patch, patulin test method that I'm speaking about today will we'll be focused on. Reference methods <clears throat> include thin layer chromatography, gas chromatography, HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography, and LCMS or liquid chrom chromatography mass spectrometry. So all of these methods have a, you know outstanding advantages, but there's also some disadvantages to all of them. Uh, so the rapid testing it really eases the burden of lab testing. So you can make use of rapid tests for screening and identifying patulin at the early stage. And that's the value, as we'll talk about in a moment as well, of the ELISA method. <clears throat> so what is patulin? It's a natural food contaminant, it's a mold, most often associated with fruits and fruit-based fruit products. As mentioned, it's a mycotoxin metabolite it obtained its name from the mold Penicillin patulinum. It's mutagenic, it's genotoxic, it's immunotoxic, and it's neurotoxic. It's responsible for acute effects, including nausea, vomiting, and other gastrointestinal issues. It can affect developing fetuses, the immune system, the nervous system, the gastrointestinal tract, and can potentially cause DNA damage. And it's been linked to liver and kidney damages as well. Foods that are most associated with contamination of patulin are fruits, including apples, cherries, pears, peaches, blueberries, grapes, oranges, bananas, and fruit-related products. Patulin can also be found in other foods such as grains and vegetables, but apples are the most common fruits that are contaminated with patulin. Fresh apple juice and, and unfermented apple cider also have high risk of patulin contamination. Contaminated apples show spoilage characteristics with brown rot, and the fruits can be contaminated during pre-harvest stage when they're grown, and also during the post-harvest period when the storage conditions are poor and not properly controlled. The risk of patulin contamination may be increased with the increasing of the storage time at a mild temperature and moist environment. Which, the true, which is true for the case of many mycotoxins. Patulin is relatively stable in fruit juice and it cannot be degraded even during heat treatment such as pasteurization. And fruits contaminated with patulin have become a worldwide issue, especially for the countries that are the main producers of apples and apple related products. And the top 10 producers of apples countries, um, China is number one at about 44.5 million tons annually followed by the US at about 4.65 million tons. Um, and then Poland, Turkey, India, Iran, Italy, Russia, France, and Chile make up the top 10 countries for apple production. Okay, regulations and recalls. Most countries have established, established regulations to protect consumers from the harmful effects of patulin. The European Union has established a maximum allowable levels of patulin of 50 part per billion for juices, 25 part per billion for apples, and 10 part per billion for foodstuffs intended for child consumption. These levels, the 50, 25, and 10, are widely used across the globe by other, by other national bodies, such as the US FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the Ministry of Health of the People's Republic of China, the Ministry of Health of Canada, the Ministry of Health of Russia, and others. Many have adopted very similar criteria. Now, there have been a series of alerts and product recalls in recent years due to the presence of excessive levels of patulin and apple-derived products. Uh, this is in Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong. It's really been a global problem. Therefore, the control of patulin in foods 
is essential for both food safety reasons and quality control of raw materials. Uh, some of the recalls, this was in 2020, uh, that occurred in 2020 and 2021 due to patchland contamination. It's impacted a wide range of juice and beverage processors. There was over 37,000 cases of an apple juice product recalled in South Africa. There were four brands of apple drinks recalled in Australia. There was recalls of apple juice in Singapore, where the Center for Food Safety warned consumers not to consume the brand. There was a producer that's under investigation in South Africa. Uh, an apple juice blend in Australia and Hong Kong was recalled, and the Center for Food Safety issued, issued a warning with the potential for a penalty of up to 6,500 US dollars and or six months in prison. And there was a recall of a 100% apple juice and cranberry juice brand in the United States. These are just some of the recalls that were uh, took place over the last couple of years. Applications. So what can be done to protect brands and consumers? And that's where the value of the rapid patchland test kit comes in. Um, some of the, the benefits and, or features of the kit uh, and you, what you're looking at on the right hand side, that's the patchland test kit. That's what's included in the kit. And we'll go through that in a moment as well. Um, but the component here, when we call it an ELISA or, or a micro tighter well plate is the plate there in the bottom on the right hand corner and the left hand side with all the little micro plate, micro tighter wells. The value of the kit, it's fast. You can get on-site results in three hours. Um, three hours versus perhaps if you're sending samples out to a con conventional laboratory or um, contract lab might take days. So having the information in three hours is very important. It allows you to make real-time decisions. What to do with the information, how to manage your program or your process. There's a low per sample cost of the test versus traditional lab methods. The cost is probably one fourth to one fifth lower than a traditional laboratory method. Uh, minimal test kit experience is required. This would be important if you had multiple processing facilities, um, don't want to or don't have the ability to implement a, a more, uh, let's call reference method process so you'd like to use a the elisa or rapid method uh, those individuals may not be very skilled because you need higher trained skilled individuals to run hplc and other therefore uh, it's a simple method and training is very easy and most people are are and certainly the customers that we have across the globe um, are not generally highly skilled individuals so it can be easily uh, taught and easily run by these individuals you can more effectively manage product quality by having the ability to test rapidly and, and, and it, certainly at different locations. You'll be able to move product faster through your processes and you can be prepared for high volume testing requirements. Uh, the kit itself will run up to 41 samples per kit. Um, we run the test in duplicate to account for any variation. So. 41 samples is what you would be able to get out of, out of, a, out of a single kit. Um, and this would be important, especially during outbreaks. If there was a potential outbreak and you wanted to really increase your testing volumes, this will give you the opportunity to do so. 41 samples in about three hours. That would be very helpful. So a little bit about competition. What is the competitive method to the ELISA? Um, there really is no other um, viable rapid ELISA other than the Eurofins technologies or Eurofins of practice product. We are the exclusive licensee of a patented high quality antibody. Um, the antibody for patulin has been very, very comp it's very complex to develop. Uh, it's a difficult and unique molecule. So uh, there are no tests really in the marketplace that I would consider viable and um, especially at such using such a high quality rapid uh, an, or high quality antibody. But we do have competition, obviously, if you compare it to maybe the laboratory methods. And I mentioned those earlier, but the chromatic, chromatic 
uh, graphic analysis such as HPLC, GC, and then recently techniques such as LCMS and GCMS. Uh, I just did a quick comparison to a laboratory. This is a mycotoxin reference lab in the UK, where if you see the difference in methods, the UK method is HPLC with the UV. Standard turnaround time with our method, three hours. The standard turnaround time at the lab was 10 days. Our limit of detection at seven part per billion. Limited detection at the lab was five part per billion. Uh, equipment is required with our test, um, though I'll talk about that in a moment as well. It is a minimal investment. Um, and then uh, operator skill level, low to medium, we're obviously uh, using a type of uh, laboratory methodology to be a higher skilled operator. And regarding accreditation, the method itself at the lab has an ISO 17025, uh, but the European Abraxas product, um, we actually internally have a ISO accreditation. Uh, the 13485 216 is for medical device quality management. And then ISO 9001 215 is for quality management system. So we have a lot of high quality built into our, uh, built into our, uh, our management process is built into our, our tests. Customer profile, who would be uh, using these, these test kits? Well, fruit juice processors, infant food companies, and contract laboratories. Certainly fruit juice processors and infant food companies would be able to use this across their production, but early uh, in production would probably be uh, a very, the best opportunity and the best uh, uh, application for the test and contract laboratories would maybe consider using these methodologies as a screening method as an alternative to a, a reference method um, and maybe a lower cost alternative too. So the test kit itself um, it is the method is a direct competitive ELISA based upon the recognition of patulin by specific monoclonal antibodies. ELISA itself is a very proven technology. Uh, it stemmed from or came from the clinical medical marketplace years back, but it's been in the food uh, industry for uh, at least 25 years. Um, and now it's very common. You'll see that there are ELISA methods for food allergens, for pathogens, for GMOs, for veterinary drug residues, uh, et cetera. Um, they're very widely used across the, the market space. The standards and samples are derivatized and then analyzed in the ELISA microtiter plate. Derivatization is important here because we're dealing with such a small molecule. So derivatization is, is a bit different than other tests um, and other, other ELISA methods that might be in the market space. But derivatization is required with the patulin test kit. The, the method allows for detection of patulin between seven and 300 part per billion, including sample preparation, and can be performed when results obtained in only three hours. And then for the performance validation that we did, we worked with four different uh, matrices, apple juice, apple cider, apple sauce, and orange juice. And for uh, any of those who are interested, we certainly can expand our, our, our library of matrices. We wish to do so. We're very open to working with uh, clients or prospective clients, taking in samples that we've not yet validated internally to look at them, to do a validation of those products. For example, with our glyphosate test kit, we started out with a, a validation of maybe one or two different matrices. We now have 37 or 38 matrices. Most of all of those came from clients who asked us to do the validation internally for, for them. So we're very open to doing that. Uh, test kit validation. The test kit validation provides uh, an assurance of reliability during normal use. And it's the process of providing documented evidence that the method does what it's intended to do. And that's very important for us to be able to share that information and to provide end users a level of confidence that they're using a high quality method. Uh, we have looked at, you know, the, the, the intent is to, to, to show that our kits are accurate, precise, specific, and reproducible and robust. So we've looked at five different uh, areas, sensitivity, specificity, 
lot to lot reproducibility, limit of quanti quantitation, and a correlation traditional to a traditional analytical method, which happened to be LCMSMS. Sensitivity. Um, the patch and ELISA test that has an estimated limit of detection, an LOD, of 90%, what we call over B over B0. And that stands for the ratio ELISA mean absorbance values of the antibody binding response in presence of free antigen to the absence of antigen. Um, so basically, our LOD is seven part per billion after the sample dilution. Uh, the middle of the test is about 50% over B over B0 is approximately 45 part per billion. And again, that compensates for the dilution. And then the determinations closer to the middle of the calibration curve give the most accurate results, which is typical for most ELISA tests. And you can see in the graph there, that would be the six standards, the curve that's set up. That's a very nice curve. Specificity, this is the extent to which a test gives results that are free from false positives. So we looked at five different potential interference here. 5-hydroxymethylfurfural, that's found when sugars are activated or heated, and it's present in many foods. So we tested against that, aflatoxin B1, deoxynivalenol, or DON, fumonacin, and ocotoxin, which are all four of those are other mycotoxins. And you can see when we detect, detected at a very high level, um, we're still seeing, uh, in part per billions, we're still seeing a very low signal on our test, meaning there are no uh, false positives against these particular compounds. Lot to lot variation. This is a frequent challenge that limits a user or a laboratory's ability to produce consistent results over time. So assuring lot to lot consistency, consistency is important to a successful testing program. Um, you know, obviously, we produce different lots. We want to make sure that they're consistent. You're not getting different results if you purchase a product one month from another month or a lot from a different lot, et cetera. So a commercially available apple cider sample was tested alongside patchland standards and controls to evaluate product consistency through quantitation in two different ELISA test kit lots. There's lot one and lot two as listed here. So all sample standards and controls were analyzed in duplicate following the derivatization per the kit instructions. And the results here will show that this percent CV for each kit run of standards and controls are statistically consistent between the two kit lots, showing excellent reproducibility. And percent CV, that's the coefficient of variation. A CV of 10 to 20 is very good. 20 to 30 is acceptable, and greater than 30 would be not acceptable. And the higher the CV, the greater the level of dispersion around the mean, but the lower the value, the more precise the estimate. So a lot one HRP would be our conjugate, and there's four, four lots within that lot. The same with the standard. Uh, our control is 0 0.10. And then apple cider, we actually tested. Uh, this is commercially bought from a store in the state, the United States, the state of Pennsylvania. And you could see where the apple cider looking at four different um, runs of that, uh, 58, 62, 56, 65, with a mean of 65.4175% CV of 7%. And on the apple cider in lot two, a percent uh, CV of 5%. Very low CV, which is excellent. Um, but interesting that a apple cider that was pulled from a local store um, was above actually the actually required uh, um, regulations. Limit of uh, quantitation, quantification. Um, this is the lowest level that an analyte can be quantified without any degree of certainty with a high level of precision and accuracy. So we validated the LOQ values by spiking gravimetric patulin. Uh, that's by weight into a residue matrix. We used apple juice, orange juice, and apple sauce to approximate these concentrations. And then at least 10 replicate test por portions were derivatized and analyzed on the ELISA method. 
The results here are all of the 10 PPB samples were detected with a percent CV of less than 20%, which again is very good. Um, product A, product B, and product C uh, were all um, commercially available branded products that we pulled for apple juice and product A, orange juice, product B, and product C is uh, uh, applesauce. And you can see the blanks, these are the samples that we tested right out of the box. Uh, we then spiked them at 10 part per billion, our percent recovery from the control. And as you go down, you'll see in the highlighted in the blue box, the percent CV. Um, and again, all of these are, are under 20%. So again, showing excellent uh, CVs and our limit of quantification or LOQ. Uh, and then we also did the LCMS MS correlation. The aim of the correlation study is to assess the closeness of agreement between results of the ELISA kit and an LCMS MS method for the determination of patulin in the specific matrices. And if you look here, the patulin samples we evaluated, there was applesauce, apple juice, apple juice, and apple cider and orange juice. So uh, on the column, uh, EA patchel and ELISA. We ran these tests with the ELISA and anything under the, the limit of detection of seven part per billion would be reported as a non-detect. However, we did get a signal with the test and we included that signal. So where we reported a 2.79 part per billion, the laboratory next to it on the right-hand side came back as less than five PPB. They weren't able to give a number, but they reported it as less than five part per billion. Um, we didn't correlate this or call this a percent correlation, though it's easy to look at these numbers and say, yeah, there's a high level of correlation. The laboratory is coming back at less than five. We're saying it's less than seven, but we're actually showing uh, some value, um, though it may not have the high level of precision that we would regard would require, but we are seeing a signal. So um, that's true for applesauce. The apple juice at 3.10 compared to less than five from the lab. The apple juice again at 2.36, less than five. This is a different variety of apple juice. Uh, apple cider, we showed on our ELISA at 33.57. The LCMS result came back at 42, correlation of 80%. And then the orange juice coming in at 17.11 part per billion. Uh, and again, this is a quantitative test, our ELISA test. So when you see a number like 17.11 or 33.57, these are actual uh, values for because it is a quantitative method. Um, and then again, the the, the uh, orange juice, the, the LCMS result was at 20, a correlation of 86%. Okay, how to run the test kit. This is the kit itself. Everything is included in the kit that's required. This is a small box, maybe 12 inches by by six by four, um, all these materials are included in it. The ELISA plate uh, is where obviously a lot of the technology occurs because there's an antibody that's coded to that plate, <clears throat> but everything is required. Uh, I will mention with this that the kit does come with three sets of, sta of standards and controls. And once a they are lyophilized, once they are reconstituted, you have about 24 hours to run them before they expire. That's why we offer additional standards and derivatizations for this. So based upon how you run the test, at least in the current state, we are looking to, to, to potentially um, work to sort of extend the shelf life on that. But if you run the test, running one sample at a time may not be the best uh, um, configuration currently. However, um, we are looking at some other other ways to get around this, but currently it's uh, it's it is lyophilized with the 24-hour exp expiration. The kit specs uh, again, it's a direct competitive ELISA, three-hour incubation. There are six standards. There's one control. It does need to be stored in refrigerated conditions. The limited and generally it's got a 12-month shelf life. The limit of detection is seven part per billion. The quantitative range is 10 to 225. The microplate reader has to have be read at 450 nanometers, which is fairly standard. Uh, I mentioned cross-reactives earlier, and then the unique antibody. Um, and this is really the core to, to our product. 
Uh, we do have this unique antibody that we have a, a license for. Um, this was developed in concert with uh, the CSIC and the University of Valencia in Spain. The materials provided in the kit, you have the micro titer plate uh, coated anti patulin antibody. Uh, that's obviously the key to it all. I mentioned the standards in three sets. You get a 10x sample diluent, uh, patulin HRP conjugate solution for derivatization reagents. You get the derivatization uh, reagent diluent, wash solution, color or substrate solution. This is a color development test, so there will be color at the end, and then a stop solution. What's not included in the test, um, and on here there's a, there's a range of things, but I will say that the key here is that uh, pipettes, microplate reader, a heat block, a vortex mixer, and a micro centrifuge. Um, these are the sort of the, the larger investment to, to sort of developing a, a small lab to run ELISA. And these, all of these can be found in a lab supply catalog. Uh, it's fairly low cost uh, in comparison to, to other alternatives. Um, but uh, it's, that, that, those are the majority of the pieces that are required to actually run, run the test. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a significant investment by any means, but those are the materials that are not provided with the kit. And then the actual running of the ELISA test, uh, it's really four steps. There's the sample prep is the first step. There is derivatization, as I've mentioned previously, uh, then running the test, and then finally interpreting the results. So it's four phases. Uh, just to review again, though, uh, this is a competitive ELISA method, um, as mentioned. And... Um, in this case here, just to give you this graphic, will show you it is a color development test. You have an antibody specific to the patulin molecule. It's, it's immobilized to the, the surface of the microplate well. And when you're running the test, uh, you're running it, there's a, a antigen samples that contain patulin that are actually from your, your, your live sample. And then there's a, a known amount of enzyme labeled target antigen. And they compete for these binding sites on the antibody. And on the top graphic there, you would see um, where there may be in the sample, whether it's apple juice or applesauce or orange juice or apple cider, if you don't have much patulin present, the binding sites are actually um, uh, filled through the enzyme labeled target uh, antigen. And that enzyme turns color. So the more of those that bind to the antibody, the darker the color. And in reverse to that on the bottom graphic there, you'll see where you have, if you have more patulin present in that sample, it binds to those antibody sites, whereas the uh, enzyme label target doesn't, and therefore you'll get um, lighter color. So, you know, it's sort of inverse, right? You have when the antigen level is the same, is high, the level of antibody bound enzyme labeled antigen is lower and the color is lighter. And then, you know, the more, the more contamination present, it's it's a, it's a lighter color. The greater the level of contamination present, uh, or excuse me, the less contamination, it's a darker color. And that information will then be read by the by the uh, uh, some type of uh, a reader. So sample prep is a uh, pretty simple actually with the ELISA. Um, First thing you want to do is get all the components should be at room temperature, take it out of the refrigerator, prepare the 1x sample diluent. It's very simple. Reconstitute the standards, the control and derivatization reagent, which are lyophilized. And then you prepare a 1x wash buffer uh, at that point, And that's very simple to do. You're not ready to actually prepare your samples. And whether it be applesauce or juice, uh, just for this case, I'll just run through the juice. You're just adding um, 0.5 ml of the sample into a 15 mil plastic centrifuge tube. We call it tube A. You then add 4.5 mils of the 1x sample diluent and you mix it thoroughly on let's say a vortex mixer. Uh, you add two mils of that sample to two mils, uh, to a two mil micro centrifuge tube. And then you centrifuge it for about five minutes. And then you transfer 40 microliters of the supernatant, that's the material that would be remain as the sample settles, you'd see that clear area. 
that needs to be 40 microliters of that needs to be put into a 12 by 75 uh, glass tube. And then you add uh, 960 microliters of the 1x sample diluent and you mix thoroughly and your sample's prepared. You're now ready to run the test into the actual uh, uh, assay or in the plate. So um, running the test. Um, once you have your samples prepared and your standards uh, and your control, everything is ready to roll. You take out your plate, you add 100 microliters of the derivatized samples, standards and controls to the plate. And again, you run these in duplicate. You then incubate for 60 minutes at room temperature and incubation is that simple. It's just putting a, a plate cover over the plate so nothing, nobody spills anything into it and just letting it sit. In the lab, there's there's no incubator that's needed for it to be placed into or anything like that. Incubation is 60 minutes. You then decant the contents. You simply take the plate, push it into a waste basket or into a sink, um, and then with a small hand washing uh, a bottle, you just squeeze the wash solution over it, clean it out, tap it on some paper towels. Um, you do that three times. And then you add 100 microliters of the HRB conjugate and you incubate that for 30 minutes. You then decant the contents again and wash it three times, again with the with the, the diluted wash buffer. And this comes in a little squeeze bottle. You simply squeeze it again, as I mentioned, over the plates. It washes everything out. You blot it onto the uh, paper towels. And then you add 100 microliters of uh, color solution and you incubate it for 20 minutes. And at this point, you'll start to see a blue color will appear. And again, related back to being a competitive assay, the darker the color, the lower the level of contamination, uh, the lighter the color, the higher the level of contamination. And then finally, you add 100 microliters of stop solution, and that turns the reaction from blue to yellow. And now you're ready to read it into the, into the plate reader. You wanna read it in about a 15 minute window. Most people don't wait more than a, a minute. They wanna get the results, so you're now able to read the results. And when you're reading the results, uh, there's a range of ways to do so. Um, there's a full 96 well plate reader that's available. This can read an entire plate quickly. So the door opens up, you drop in the plate. Uh, it'll read them literally in seconds at 450 nanometers. And this particular, the full plate reader, uh, usually they have a USB port that downloads the information right to your laptop. And uh, you'll be able to expedite that information into a part per billion units of measurement. Uh, plate readers generally read absorbance. So, um, well, they do read absorbance, but you will need some type of uh, conversion. And we do provide that to part per billion units of measurement. The micro well strip reader on the bottom uh, is a more simplified version. This actually reads two to three strips. The strips pull out of the micro, micro tighter well plate, and you could then put them into the, uh, the unit there, just snap them in, and it reads either two or three strips, again, at 450 nanometers. Some of these have um, a printer on board and they'll print uh, the results right there and they can be downloaded then by hand into a, uh, um, a program which will convert over to you to part per billion units of measurement. These are generally low cost, these type of readers. Um, and then finally, on the right-hand side, we have a, a Bolt, the Bolt Automated Analyzer. And I'll just mention with this that, um, this is developed by a company called Gold Standard Diagnostics. This is a Eurofins Technologies company uh, in the United States. And these automated analyzers are open systems that can be run on most assays. We have many of our tests already on this platform, uh, whether it be glyphosate or allergens or, or other mycotoxins. And Patulin has been validated as well for application in this. Um, this is quite interesting because all the operator has to do is extract the samples and place them into the unit along with a plain 96 well plate. You shut the door and you program it. The instrument does everything that I took you through previously in the sample, sample um, uh, or operation of the test. So it dispenses, it washes, washes, it shakes, it incubates, it reads the wells with a built-in microplate reader and it displays the results uh, on a on, small onboard computer. Um, again, it's an open system, can be used for other things beyond just patulin. So if you're currently running a LISA test manually, 
this might be something uh, to consider as well, well for all of your other ELISA methods. And in summary, uh, the Patchland test uh, kit is fast. The results are in about three hours versus traditional offsite HPLC lab results, which are three to 10 days. It's a simple methodology. You only need basic lab skills. Um, we have people who've never picked up pipetters before, and we train them on the, how, to, how to use a pipetter. That's the most complex component of, of running the test, how to withdraw and extract liquid from a tube or into a vial. Um, again, uh, it's a fairly standard technology, ELISA. Uh, you, many of you have probably already heard of it or have used it or have certainly seen it in food testing. So many labs and food companies are also already familiar with the technology. It's low cost. I mentioned earlier about one quarter to one fifth that of a lab, traditional lab cost. Uh, quantitative results. This is a fully quantitative uh, assay and it meets the regu current regulations in the EU, US and globally. It is, is, is a unique offering. It's the only high quality patch on the test kit on the market. We are the exclusive license, licensee of this patented antibody. And that's really the core is the high quality of the antibody. And that's why there's uh, only us, or there may be a, another group or so out there, but we have the, what we believe by far the greatest, uh, uh, or the product with the greatest level of quality. And in summary, the unique rapid patch lens test kits, they help identify contamination in juice production and can benefit juice companies by saving time and costs for the good and fast control of products through the entire juice production chain. We, uh, to sort of wrap up here, we have a uh, Patchelin demo video on YouTube. All you have to do is go to YouTube and enter Patchelin Elisa test kit. Uh, our video will pull up. This will take you through more detail if you wish to share with some of your potential lab operators to see if it's something that would maybe meet their needs. Um, easy to find and um, it's, it's a good instruction uh, overview of how the test kit works. Uh, and it's got some uh, nifty music, I guess, as well with it. So. Um, yeah, and we're, we're at this point, we're done with our overview of the Patchelin test kit. Hopefully, uh, there was some good information learned here that was helpful to you all to, uh, think or consider the product for, for an application within your, uh, your processes. Um, thank you for your attention. And at this stage, you certainly have my email to write, uh, any, to me about any questions or any thoughts, what you may have, but also, um, I'm available to take questions now through the uh, uh, the question and answer component that's on in the uh, in the uh, on the right hand side of your screen, the, the uh, chat area or question area. So I'll try to go to that and see if there's any questions currently. Okay. One of the questions, thank you, is, is there a specific plate that is needed to be used for the bolt or is there a normal ELISA plate? Yes, a normal ELISA plate will do. Um, if you're running, let's say multiple tests like um, patulin versus allergens, there might be some differences in some of the templates that hold the actual samples, uh, the sample vials but uh, there's nothing with the plate. It's a standard ELISA plate. And um, yes, another question was, will the presentation be available? And um, yes, I believe it will. Um, I think we've recorded this, so it will be available. And through Eurofins Technologies, we'll make sure we get that to you. So if you just reach out to me at the email, I'll be happy to, uh, to get that to you. Okay, um, if there's no other questions, then please, again, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you again for your time. Oh, we have one more. Uh, do you have any idea of patulin presence in mango or pineapple or grapes or other fruits? Um, I believe we're doing some work with grapes. Currently, I would have to check with our R&D deed group. Um, I've heard some questions in the past about mango. So we have not 
any experience currently. We haven't done any validation, but as mentioned earlier in the presentation, if this is an application that's important to you and your 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 consumers of your product, then we would obviously will look into this. So um, let's stay in touch. And uh, you know, if you'll be able to reach out to me again, I'll follow up on this with our R and D and uh, be happy to get back to you about that. Um, and uh, another question is, does apple juice can have different bricks degree? Can we analyze it? I do not know about the answer to that. I'll have to, um, I'm writing that down. And if, again, if you'll reach out to me on that, I will get that answer to you. Check with our R&D folks. Um, application in lemon. We haven't done anything with lemon yet, but the assumption is if we can run with, uh, do get through orange juice without any issues, my assumption is we would be able to do lemon as well. I have, uh, I know we've had a previous question about lemon once or limes, but uh, I'll have to go back and look. But certainly if that's a, of interest again, we would be able to do something fairly quickly. Um, and this, these validations that I'm speaking of are simple. We just take the samples. We usually ask prospects if they have samples they could send to us or we can find our own samples but you know something specifically if it's regionally maybe there's there's some advantage in having those those samples from that particular region um, and then we can generally do a fairly quick uh, validation um, so again this is something that's not that complex and we're just you know and in fact at this point I would say we're looking for any assistance with respect to samples and opportunities and We'll learn more about other applications across the globe. So I would have to get back to you on that as well. So again, if you reach out to me at James Donovan at EurofinsUS.com, I will get answers to any of these questions that I haven't been able to answer here. 